News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. Welcome to Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorson with Thor's Hammer, Carpent Green Wood Turning. I'm Alan Gilbreth, darkhookmedia.com. And I'm Maximilian, and boy, am I excited for today's holiday. Oh, what do we Happy got? Happy National Turkey Vulture Day. <laughs> I love me a good turkey vulture. Not for consumption, though, like Alan. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't eat those. Uh, even they Alan eat draws the line. No, no, no. They eat you. Alan, I don't remember ever thinking about turkey vultures till I moved here to the Mid-South, and mm. uh, I encountered them quite a bit on my time in the country uh, out there in the uh, Delta <coughs> of Mississippi and all across oh, yeah. the... Uh, the Boy, turkey vultures are interesting. You got to... You got to admire their dedication, their teams. Well, are they team players or are they out for themselves? So They are inadvertently team okay. players. They, they don't mean to be. I love, um, uh, since we don't have to worry about breakfast, I love some of their famous defense mechanisms. Are you familiar, Alan? I am familiar with all of them, and you're going to leave them unsaid. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, Max, I'm going to one-up you and tell you I have a friend that adopted one. What's okay. their name? Igor. Igor. Okay. What else would you name your turkey vulture? That's fair. And it was a little disconcerting that you would go, you know, go over to his farm and a large turkey vulture would follow you around. Would you mind, Joe, if a little later or just um, after we set the table, if I tell you something kind of cool about the turkey vulture in history? I, I'd be disappointed if you didn't, Max, because uh, I actually think turkey vultures are pretty interesting. And hey, man, we all they everything serves a purpose in our ecosystem right now. Even mosquitoes, I guess. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, unlike we the mosquito, the turkey vulture things. really does. He's kind of the cleanup crew. Right. It's like the road and, the, the yeah. road cleaners of our, uh, of our uh, world. They, they perform a very, very important surface. Uh, they really kind of, um, they, I guess there's step one in recycling. There you go. Exactly. So they get things down to their bare essence. So, okay, I, I'm actually interested in turkey vulture day. Um, we hope you are, too. If you are interested... Uh, tell us how you celebrated, because you can't tell us now. Uh, let's just lay our cards on the table. We're recording this because Tiger football is going on, right, Alan? So uh, we still want you to call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline. Actually, probably just text us, and we'll take those messages, and we'll definitely address them next uh, next week. So don't mm -hmm. worry about that. But uh, you can get in touch with us there at the uh, Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline, 901-683-0989. And uh, we also invite you to go over to the uh, Tool Talk Radio Facebook page and uh, like the page and share the page and see what posts that we uh, put up there. I feel like we're going to be hearing a lot from Max today. Uh, later in the show, he's got kind of a follow-up report about uh, the history of the stapler. I guess we tr we really got you interested last week, right, Max, with our I guess I was riveted about it. Yeah, mm. okay. <laughs> oh! In our great moments in building history, in honor of uh, football, I guess I probably could have done something more Memphis-centric, but this, I feel like this is apropos, Alan. Uh, we're going to be talking about Franklin Field over at Penn State because it is the oldest football, it's the oldest college football stadium that's still in use, and it's actually got a pretty rich history. Oh, it and does. It's very interesting, and I, I make sure we uh, block out a little bit of time to talk about the the track that they have there for um, their four hundred meter. There's some actually interesting details about that that we're gonna that we're gonna discuss, and it actually relates to proper home planning. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and we always try to tie it into home improvement. Um, we have uh, I, I, this. Um, I'm learning all sorts of life lessons in our uh, living room remodel that we're doing. Well, I should say living room redecoration because we're not okay. remodeling a whole lot. But it's funny how even even at our age, you can still learn mm -hmm. things. And uh, I think they're actually, uh, you know, I think they're actually some pretty important things. Alan, I feel like we've got about a week and a half or two weeks of Alan's <laughs> week in review because for one thing, we couldn't even get to everything you did last week. And uh, um, this week, it sounds like it's been even more. I, I know that you're always more active in the fall. I don't really know why that is, but uh, the fall seems to be the time everything's happening. Well, you're harvesting, right? I oh, mean, yeah. Let's face it. Alan's back to practically got his own ecosystem in his own backyard. So we got a lot coming at you today. We're not going to we're not going to tease everything because you know how that goes. But Max, I know you're dying to tell us more about turkey vultures. So talk to me. Well, before they were kind of considered like negatively back in, I'll just kind of pick on ancient Egypt. 
they were actually very revered especially among like the iconography of like the gods and everything because there's a prominent god goddess by the name of Nekbet who is a goddess and patron of ancient Egypt and what's pretty cool is a lot of royalty would wear vulture crowns as one of the more you know like so as that's a form what those of protection. were. Yep. I thought those were like uh, hawks or eagles or something like that. No, no, or falcons. No, no nope, those were vultures. good old vultures. So, Cleo, <laughs> so, so Cleopatra's got a vulture planted on her head. Um, well, okay, but what about what other? Uh, so the turkey vulture, though, what makes the turkey vulture distinct from other ones? It's not as ugly, I guess, as some vultures, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah, it is. is it? <laughs> I'll freely tell you. It? Yeah, they're pretty. They're pretty hideous. Okay, they don't have any feathers on their heads because they reach inside bodies. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, the feathers would get pretty. Yeah, uh, the feathers get up. would get terrible and nasty. So that's why they have a featherless head. Of the the vulture was revered throughout history because a they could soar for literally hours. They're just on a there. thermal updraft. They're just circling you with no problem, mm -hmm. taking their time, their vision. They were even thought to be able to see into the future. Their eyesight was so good. Oh, no, well, that's I mean, they're, you know, thousands of feet in the air and they're spotting, you know, a limping ground squirrel at 500 yards over it, you know, so their ability to find something, see something and maintain their stature of absolutely legendary i guess i had a question because you know we've seen the old cowboy movies where mm -hmm. the guy they ran out of water and their and their horse ran off and they're staggering mm. through the desert and the vultures are circling i mean yep. the vultures know death is coming to things right oh yeah do they wait what if you pass out do well they, all right. <laughs> <laughs> do we they were move we, the process along or what I was in Campwood, Texas. I knew he'd have a story. <laughs> Years it's so ago. easy to bait. Now. It is, it is, because it's, <laughs> it's so simple. We're doing a roof on a commercial building, so we've got about 60,000 square feet of roof up there. Oh, my God. And we're up there, and we got, you know, of course, this is... In the in, in the canyon section of Texas, so this is out west, like John Wayne movie stuff. Oh yeah, right. Yep. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were just outside of Hondo, Texas. This is where they filmed all the John Wayne John Wayne movies. Of so we're out there, we're working on the roof. We get up there at like six o'clock in the morning before it gets too hot. But let me tell you, by eight o'clock, we had about thirty of them <laughs> circling the roof because they're like, you know, if those bozos stay up there long enough. Really? We're having barbecue by three. But they, you know, don't they understand modern technology? Because things have evolved a lot. We're, I mean, they don't they know you could just go down to the drinking fountain or the, the you know, get some well, water they, out of the sink? You know, or? they're just sitting on a thermal. They're just taking their time. Okay. Now, what was impressive, we did a, uh, we did a movie a while back, and we were up outside of uh, Franklin, Kentucky at a state park. And what we didn't know was we were shooting right where all of the turkey vultures roosted. Uh, it's funny because I always wonder where do, what is their headquarters? They're, they're hanging like, out. They're they? hanging out in the trees next on the side of this mountain, and we had this beautiful shot to film and everything. So we're there, you know, four o'clock in the morning, setting up equipment and all that. About seven o'clock, when it starts warming up, we we realized we were not alone. <laughs> and we were there with like 500 turkey vultures all starting their morning, you know, circling our camp, trying to get the thermals, you know, trying to ride the thermals up as the heat rose. That was a, I got to tell you, watching those guys get up and get started like a turkey vulture volcano. Yeah. It was vulture. It was, um, you know, instead of Sharknado. Vulture NATO. Yeah, we had, we had Vulture NATO. <laughs> and uh, that was a very, very impressive sight. Well, I think we're learning something here, too, but uh, I, I, because I got more questions. So, do they only eat dead things? I mean, do they kill things? Or do, or do they, they hasten eat, the process? Do they eat nuts? Do they eat anything? You know? No, no, they're, they're carnivores. So what do they do? Do they just have to they, wait they, for something to die? They carnivores. Um, I mean, eagles don't wait around. They'll they'll kill. Well, they, they are need. raptors, and I mean, you know, if there was a mouse moving slow enough, he ain't gonna make it. Okay. You know, if they're they are there to clean up. Yeah. So they are mostly looking for carrion. They're they're not an aggressive animal. They're not looking for your chihuahua. You know, unless he gets hit by a car. I guess I'm wondering because I'm just taking myself back to the days when they would make like wine skins out of like ox stomachs or whatever. Right. The heck they, well, 
I would have to believe turkey vultures must have the strongest stomachs in the world because oh yeah, look what they're eating. <laughs> well, there, there's Does even it processed, you know, rotted stuff or whatever? well, yeah. There's even a certain type of African vulture that specializes in bones. Uh, so their stomach acids are so strong. They 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 they're bone specialists. There's yeah. got to be some. Yeah, that's pretty interesting too. Yeah, so. they they they're a, they're a sturdy breed. Okay, so what do you think the appropriate way to celebrate Turkey Vulture Day is? Because stay out of their way. I would say leave alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, would they make? You said they can be pets. I'm I'm, a, I'm assuming no, they're No, I didn't say they could be pets. You I said, said your friend had a pet. Well, he, your friends are weird anyway. So. He he worked with animal rehab, and one of them, a chick, got found, and he ended up raising it. Mm. So he wound up with a buddy. I wonder if it's one of those where they thought they were raising one thing and they no, got another. We knew exactly what it was. Okay. Well, I can't <laughs> promise today's show isn't going to play out like that. You may think you're getting one thing and it's going to unfold like another. But anyway, stay tuned because whatever happens, uh, you're going to want to hear it. You're listening to Tool Talk Radio. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. We have radon coming from below. We have asbestos in the ceilings. These are silent killers. You are the silent killer. News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Yeah, it wouldn't be Tool Talk Radio without an insult to uh, Toby reference. Anyway, and welcome back to uh, Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning. Here with my buddy, Alan Gilbreth from darkoakmedia.com and our pal Max over there behind the glass. You can call, uh, well, you can text us at the Big Amp Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989 and leave a message because uh, obviously you're listening to this uh, off hours. We hope by this time the Tigers have won their, won their game that they're uh, playing right now. But um, anyway, uh, we'd love to hear from you because uh, especially we'd love to know how you celebrated na- uh, National Turkey Vulture Day. We're learning a little bit of, a little bit more about those guys than we maybe thought we would when the show started. I didn't There's even know. There's still more. Yeah. Don't worry. I, I find them interesting creatures, but um, let's keep our conversation out in nature, Alan. Let's let's shift gears a little bit. It's been a wet. Okay, so I, w- I was looking at this here. I was checking my notes. Uh, according to you, because I know you pay attention to rainfall and things, because you have a, you have all those plants and everything in your backyard. According to you, July was a, pr- a pretty wet month. Of course, dry, uh, August was very dry. Mm-hmm. September started out pretty reasonably. We had a nice little right. shower. Well, I don't know what a tree, you know, I, how, I guess I'm wondering, I always think about the health of our trees going into winter right. and everything, and I don't really know what their water requirements are or whatever. So what what is the status of our trees and bushes, you think, at the moment? So. Well, depending upon what you have, of uh, there there have been a number of tree limb breakages all over the city. Oh yeah, because uh, we we had this very long, very hot, dry spell. Mm. Now it wasn't as hot as like last year, but last year it was brutally hot and intermittent rain every every few days. The month of August just looked at us and went, I, I, I hope you're ready. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's just going to be dry. It's not going to be fun. And between the heat and the dry, a lot depends upon how well rooted your plants were. So I know a lot of bushes got burnt up. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're just brown and crinkly now as you drive around town. Uh, a lot of them will recover. If you go up and look at them really close now, you'll see little green leaves starting to reappear on them because the bush wasn't killed. It just dropped its leaves in the heat and the dry. Uh, you're also going to start. Wait, sorry. I'm always learning. I got a question. So if a bush gets too dry, it'll drop the leaves because it, it needs to save any water it can yep. for its survival. Oh, that's very interesting. So and then the, they come back. And this is okay. this is how after the really brutal cold we had over the over the the, uh, the winter season plus this really hard dry spell a lot of the oak trees right now are still reacting to august and they've already begun to curl and drop their leaves mm, yeah so you're starting to get a lot of leaf fall even though it's in the 80s 
we had a little bit of rain, everybody's happy, but a lot of the plants are still responding to that dry. So yeah. when you go out and look at your yard and go, why have I got so many leaves out here? Well, it's because your, your trees and bushes really didn't have any water for a month. That's interesting. I never thought about that. I thought leaves just fall when they fall. But. No, no. The tree's trying to protect itself. It's trying to uh, eliminate excess evaporation. Um, so here's what I'm wondering, because um, now I will tell you, I'll, I'll, I will give my wife credit because during August, she wasn't out. Uh, I think you, you even had the advice. What was it? Uh, take care of your trees. The grass will take care of itself. Something like that. Yep, yep, yep. She was out watering. She, she had a steady little flow. She'd leave it on all day on one tree and then maybe the next day do another tree. So she was watering the trees during the uh, during the hot spell. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering is whenever I've seen these trees that fall over in the winter, like where the whole tree falls over, it's almost looks like the roots just died about two feet into the ground. Right. Or they probably did. And is that because of dry or is that what I, I guess I'm wondering, because you know how like they say root, a root system can go into the ground as far as, you know. Well, if you look at where to put a tree. So we're, we're going to talk about landscaping 101 okay. of different trees have different root systems. Some of them have a tap root. Uh, the best thing I can think of as an example is uh, in your yards, the weed, a dandelion. Oh, they go yeah. straight down, right? Yeah, it's a big, huge, long root that you just about kill you to try to yank that thing out of the ground. Uh, a tap root generally is looking for water, and tap roots are what mess up your plumbing. Are they the ghosts? They, they go sideways? The other ones that go down. So, like, let's say they buried your, your sewer pipe 10 feet underground. Okay. Well, those deeper tap roots are what find those sewer lines when they get a crack in them or something, and that's where you get tree roots in your system. Now, other trees have much more surface roots, and that's where you wind up. You, you see somebody's yard, and you see tree roots all over the top of the surface of the ground. Mm. Now, if you were to pile mulch up around that tree and then come back a year later and try to move that mulch, you'll discover that the tree put little uh, feathery roots all through that mulch, extracting all the nutrition from it that it can. Now, that's interesting. So, you know, what goes on with the plant world is actually pretty aggressive. Now, yeah. they also suffer from a wide variety of diseases, just like any other living thing. And they get a lot of pests. We have boring beetles. We have termites. We have funguses that affect them positively and negatively. And when a tree keels over, generally something has affected it and it's near the end of its life cycle. So something could have affected the roots and it doesn't have as good a grip as it used to. Of we have of uh, basically kind of a type of mold that will hollow out the inside of a tree. Mm, so I've the tree those. is nowhere near. You know, when the tree blows over and you look in it, you actually look all the way up the trunk and it's a hollow tree. And it's full of you know ants and everything all right, and all that. All right, yep. Let's talk about ants for a second. All right, ants do not burrow into healthy good wood. Right. Ants are looking to exploit moisture, soft wood, something that somebody else has already softened up. So I love it when people tell me, oh, I got ants eating my house. Hmm. It's like, no, you got ants showing you where the problem is. Right, yeah. So you have a leak in your roof. So when you see an excessive number of carpenter ants up and down a tree, that might be telling you you may need to get an arborist to come look at your tree. Don't just spray the ants. Right. They're they're not the problem. They're the symptom. And I would think too, um I, I guess I'm wondering if there's telltale si signs from the outside. Because I've seen limbs that look pretty darn healthy, but then like you say, they fall off and they smell and they're rotted uh, and they're full well, of bugs you know, and if you've got big oak trees, you've got what's called deadfall. Okay. And that is where the tree has self pruned or something has killed a branch or another branch covered it so it couldn't get any light and that branch dies off. Well, these things will eventually lichen up, mold over and fall off. And you'll get that in every mature tree group. 
the tree I hate the most is, of course, my fam- my favorite, our lovely pear tree. Oh, the, the wait, the Bradford. The pear Bradford. Tree. Yeah. I hate that thing because they only realistically can live about 25 to 30 years because they will break under their own weight. Mm. So if you've got these trees and we all know what they look like. You know, and you've had this tree for a while and it's got the long branches kind of stretching out. Get ready. They're they're probably going to snap off. Okay. So, again, I would get if you can, I would replace that tree. If you can't replace the tree, it's probably time to have an arborist get out there now and trim off the extreme lengths of it so the branches don't snap off and wind up in your roof. Right. Yeah. You know, so this is my call to action for, you know, right now, while it's really pretty and it's pleasant, go walk around your property and look for these potential problems. And you can see them pretty easily because off of an oak tree or a pear tree or whatever, you got that one big branch that just stretches on and you get a feeling that it's stretched out just a little too far. Yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's best I can tell you. you Especially you, if it goes over your house, your patio, or your car. You just reminded me of a rule of thumb. Because I always like things that anybody can put their head around and understand. I thought my wife's friend, because she, she understands, uh, she's an arborist too, but... Uh, she said a good rule of thumb is if you have a tree and the and the branch is more or less going up, you know, vertically at a, at a little bit of an angle, that's a good sign. Yes. When it goes out horizontally... That's a problem. That's but a bad Why sign. is that, though? I mean, well, it's easy to recognize. You go, okay, good. That's... Is it because it's like a cantilever? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Why Which, is it doing that, though? Well, or... you're looking at the physics, and you're looking at the tree's quest for light. Oh, so it's just it's trying to find light wherever it is. And can. this is where, of, all right, so like on your hedge, you know, we, we all have a bushes and a hedge right there in our in our yards. This is why you trim the hedge back. And kind of keep it nice and even and full looking. Because if you don't, uh, we've all seen that house where it got a little unruly. Mm -hmm. Well, when you trim it back, you'll notice the inside of it is naked. Yeah. Because it's constantly looking for more light and how to reach it. And they can overgrow themselves. And then it's putting all this weight and strain. Now everything's stretched way out and it's probably going to get a little extra weight on it. Some wind, some ice. And it's going to break. So pay attention to your trees because we're getting that time of year and uh, you'll pay the price in the winter. That's when. Yes, you will. That's when it's going to happen. And we don't want power lines falling and, oh, and no. all that and all that fun stuff. Although I will say I've been seeing MLGW out there proactively trimming limbs. So so hats off to those guys. But uh, uh, you're listening to Tool Talk Radio. We're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the life lessons I'm learning redecorating our living room. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. Okay, you know what? Shut up. News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. All right, and we'll go back to uh, Tool Talk Radio coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. That's what the turkey vultures say whenever we're interfering with their job. I guess so. Uh, I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor Sammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning, here with my buddy Alan Gilbreth from darkoakmedia.com and our pal Max over there behind the glass. You can call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989, especially if you want to let us know how you're celebrating uh, Turkey Vulture National Turkey Vulture Day. Alan's friend has a turkey vulture as a pet named Igor, so <laughs> I hope he bought him some something appropriate, or maybe at least he threw a carcass out in the backyard. It's- for his pleasure so but uh you know <laughs> what do you feed igor does he just Eat. get st- well i'm just saying do you go buy a, a pound of hamburger and throw chuck it in the backyard or i guess i'm wondering what the you know is that dead enough for him oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah do you get him a okay i don't know i know they sell bags of rats and things they, like they're, that they're not picky yeah they're okay not picky. that's one thing you gotta say for them you know how like you know kids you're constantly when they're growing up nagging them to eat their 
eat the everything on their plate. You don't have that issue. No, with, uh, no, with no, no, no. Don't have that so. issue. Okay. Um, hey, You're worried about him giving you an estimate is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In a minute, we're going to jump into a, a conversation because, I'm, you know, hey, I'm always happy to learn. And it's funny. I Even now, I'm learning things uh about the world just in the uh, process of redecorating our living room so uh, we're going to jump into that in just a second before we do that uh you know who else is always constantly learning and uh, happily so is our good buddy larry brown with brown refrigeration and that's because larry is always dealing with the latest technology and beyond he it's interesting he's um He's not just thinking about what's going on now. He's always looking down the road at what's coming. And that's probably why he's maintained such a successful business with uh, Brown Refrigeration. Uh, it's important your HVAC company is up on the latest technology and is uh, well, ver you know, you, you you need certification for these things. Their they're, they're, uh, technicians don't just show up and, uh, you know, they, they, they have to be qualified. There's great training that goes into being a technician with uh, Brown Refrigeration because the HVAC unit is one of the most important features of your home. When it's working properly, it more or less will pay for itself. And uh, it's, uh, it's important to know uh, – that it's working with um, uh, keeping the air conditioned properly, especially with all the humidity we have out here. Brown Refrigeration um, works exclusively with trained products because uh, those are always the most state of the art. They also uh, work with the Remy Halo system, which uses the UV power of the sun to create the cleanest air possible for your home. And it's always a good idea to get uh, Brown Refrigeration out to your home once or twice a year for a, a, a tune up. Let them look over your system. Let them check everything out. Uh, possibly you may need to get your air ducts cleaned and uh, they can also identify if there may be problems in the future where you might want to think about replacement for your HVAC unit. And if you do need to replace it and you need financing, they also have great financing. They're a rock solid company. We love Brown Refrigeration and they also answer their phones. So, uh, which is nothing to nothing to sneeze at. There's there's contractors out there that don't do that. We've we've encountered those, Alan. But uh, get in touch with them. You can call them directly at 901-362-1881 or go to their website brownref.com. Um, so, Alan, it's it's interesting. It's uh, I think we've talked about this in the past. How you do one thing in your home and suddenly it snowballs and all this innovation mm -hmm. takes place and all this motivation takes place. It's funny the things you can live with and then suddenly you can't live with it anymore. And you just, I I don't know why that is. Uh, I don't know why we get that way. You know, I know, but anyway, so I bought a couch. <laughs> right, right. It. Okay. Just... We remodeled. The, the, so anyway, but what I'm, what I'm uh, learning is I guess we're learning about the, the, basically we really are less is more type people. We went through our bookshelves. We had hundreds of books. Right. And if we're being honest with ourselves, I mean, I read them years ago. There was a period in my life where all I did is read books. Right. I know I'm never going to read them again. I already read the book. So why are they sitting up on the bookshelf, cluttering the bookshelf? And I know my wife's not going to read them because she doesn't care about, you know, the history of uh, where Batman came from. or what, Right, uh, right, <laughs> right. So we, we donated probably two thirds of our books and everything. And we've, we've redecorated the bookshelves and boy, do they look nice. We, we've, we've gone with a less is more approach. We put it in a few little accoutrements, and I think you'd, you'd approve. We put, like, three plants up there. No, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's a good place to start. But, but anyway, it's, it's it was it, it was nice to learn getting rid of stuff. is it, I think getting rid of stuff and making space is its own decorative choice. You know what I mean? Well, you know, as I pointed space. out, about every seven years, your lifestyle changes, mm -hmm. whether you admit it or not. Uh, we know a lot of people that are stuck in the insert decade here. Boom, boom, you know. Yep. Uh, you know, I got friends that are, oh, they're so 2000. I got friends that are still stuck in the 80s. Uh, you know. Don't look at me that way, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah. you, you, you just have to be a little brutally honest sometimes and go, have I even touched that in a year? That's or what it is. Or two years. Yep. Or five years. Well, you know, but I might. Well, you're not. Yeah, or that, somebody the, gave us that plate as a wedding present. Well, it's been sitting in the back right, of your cabinet. You're right. never going to use it. I am never going to eat off of right. the Lilo and Stitch commemorative plate. <laughs> you know, 
you know, I, I might hang it on the wall, but nobody's going to eat off of it. So let's put things in their proper in their proper place. Of the biggest thing is clutter. Mm-hmm. Just you set it down, and it's still there. Right. And, and that's just you know, you had a reason, you did it, you got it, you bought it. Now, my kick this summer has been finishing projects. Uh, well, that's a funny thing to say, but it's it probably makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, you know, my garage, you know, well, you know, I had a little period of time there where, oh, I don't know, I couldn't walk. So, that's you know, true. a few projects got behind. I couldn't simply couldn't do them. Thank goodness, you know, a little surgery and a lot of rehab later. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, the, the garage is the garage is back in the target zone and it's kind of like, you know, well, yesterday, yesterday's perfect example, walked out there and I went out there and I just picked up one thing, just first thing and went, okay, why are you here? Right. What was I going to do with you? All right. Well, let's go do that right now and finish the project. And it's like, okay, that's done. So yeah. that's one thing off the shelf. All right. What's this next? Oh, this next eight feet of shelf. Well, you know what? It's good that I have an empty dumpster right now. Right. Because all of it, and I mean all of it, went into the uh, the big green donation department to the sanitation. Yeah. It's like, no, because I'm not going to do any of this anymore. And the frightening part is, Joe, this will surprise you. A lot of it was planters. Whoa. Well, because I was trying to think of the things that would that you would collect like the things that you can't say no to when you when you see it at a shop and it probably involves plants and well you know food this, things and everything well, these were you know the the pot the repots from purchases and all of this kind of just hubris that had built up in a pile and it was like all right well I'm never going to use these mm -hmm. so let's get them packed up and let's take them to the recycle bin what can be recycled if it can't be recycled let's get it into the dumpster let's get it out of here and it's shocking a little tiny bit at a time and one of my favorite phrases here is eat the elephant one bite at a time do not look at the huge pile and let yourself get overwhelmed well you know that's what we're encountering here with the living room because in the past, I'm like, we need a new couch. We need a new chair. I got to paint everything. We got to scrape this ugly popcorn ceiling off. We need the fire. There was a lot to do. However, it is interesting when you do just once a week, I'm going to do this two hour project. Exactly. And it's funny how all of a sudden it transforms everything. And a little tip out there for you young couples, especially the wives. Um, if you want to know how to ma manipulate your husband, don't don't talk about the whole you might have a you might have a big plan in in mind right. for well just say hey honey will you help me hang this one thing you'd be Weird. amazed how it snowballs and suddenly he's like well you know we also probably ought to do this and you know then you can see the, the you know you can see the the, the wives uh, <laughs> rubbing their hands together going okay I got them because right, that's well, how I, it happens man I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna desex us that slightly and say it works equally well on either partner no it's okay well you're it right it works equally well on either partner but don't overwhelm it yeah just say let's get a new you know something. if you're gonna do window treatments today then that is today's plan. Now, the overall grand scheme of things may be a whole new room, but it's Saturday afternoon. It's two o'clock. Let's knock out the window treatment. Well, the dirty little secret is because once you knock the window treatment out, the thing next to it, whatever that might oh, be, yeah. is going to oh, look yeah. terrible. The very next then thing. the other thing you do. And so as things snowball and look worse uh, when they come up next to your new stuff, suddenly you've got a whole well, new uh, I always tell everybody, room. look, have a grand plan. Know what you want it to look like when you're done. However, don't establish a rigid hierarchy of how to get there, because a lot of times it's going to be a little organic. That's that's a good rule of thumb, I would say for sure. Things happen in their own way, because in the middle of if you're redoing your kitchen or bathroom, well, you know what? Your roof, a limb may fall through your roof or your car may break or something. So be flexible. But if you get it started, it'll get done. Yeah. Well, you know, recently I'm putting together a bathroom, building a bathroom from the studs. I introduced everybody into what I call job Tetris. Okay. <laughs> and this is, okay, if you'll take a second 
and think it through. Well, if you put this piece first, then that piece fits easier. Then this piece goes up easier. Then that piece goes up easier. Less cutting, less measuring, and everything lines up. Just think it through. Yeah, there you go. Well, it's a fun. It sounds like the perfect lead in to find out what Alan did this week, because I have a sense there was a lot of Tetris going on. So uh, let, let, let's find out that, that that when we come back here on Tool Talk Radio Hand me the caffeine, Max. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. Is there anywhere in this town where we could buy a shrubbery? News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. You know, I should know what movie that comes from, Alan, but I, do. I know you do. Really? I just... Are you I serious? mix up which ones they are. Oh I mean, they all blend gosh. together in my head. It's anyway, not the life of Brian. We know it's Monty Python, whatever. Oh. But, okay. Hey, they've, they've put out a lot of material. It's easy to confuse Be careful. Them. I'll have to say me to you. Okay. <laughs> and welcome back to uh, Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. Hey, I admit my my faults here in the air. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning, here with my buddy Alan Gilbreth from darkoakmedia.com and our pal Max over there behind the glass. I think it's a lack of caffeine. It might be. Um, you can uh, call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989. You'll have to leave messages, though, because, uh, uh, you know, and we'll find out about it next week. I really hope you will, especially if you're out there celebrating National Turkey Vulture Day <laughs> or if you've got any really good stories with Let, uh, turkey vultures. I have to imagine Deuce has a few. Let's just say I hope they're not celebrating with you. Yeah. <laughs> or on you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say you're not the guest of honor. No, but uh, so. turkey vultures are very interesting. I dare say everybody in the mid south has seen them. I mean, Alan, mm -hmm. you see them in the suburbs; they're not shy. They'll they'll fly into your neighborhood. Oh, and... they used to sit on the top of my shop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, again, a little disconcerting at my age. You walk out there and there's turkey vultures lined up on the top of your workshop. Yeah. What are they saying about your? Uh... It's like, are you guys here to give me an estimate? You here to help? What are you doing? You know, that's... you just hear like the Jaws music playing. It. Uh, well, you know, it's it's a lot slower than that. It's it's more like a symphony. You know, it's like dinner music. Not you know? to not to beat this into the <laughs> ground, but if you're up on a on a ladder and you see a bunch of turkey vultures circling, is that a uh, critique on your on your uh, work safety or your you know your uh, or your craftsmanship? Are they saying this guy's this guy's a joke? He's fallen. I, actually, <laughs> it is because you are working in a hot spot. Okay. I actually figured that out. Why do they have a tendency to circle where you're working? Okay. And it's generally because you're on a roof or a, a pavement area that is warmer than the ground around it, creating an upwell or a thermal updraft. And that makes it easier for them to circle. Uh oh, so it's more of a it's more about the aerodynamics than them saying okay. Than them paying any attention to you. Okay, all right. Because I was about to say, I mean, I don't like the idea of them, you know, circling me when I'm well, working. But, well, uh, being from Texas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. you know, having lived in a desert environment, of you know, we discovered that they would be circling like the mall. Mm. You know, because there's 200,000 square feet of roof that's creating more and it's, uplift. Okay. So that's letting them get higher and higher and higher so they can go off and then go find lunch. Okay, gotcha. All right, well, that, that clears that up. So We're learning they, don't a lot worry, today. Don't worry. They weren't targeting you specifically, but if you were to fall, they'd be there to, well. They're ready to help. Help later. Okay, yeah. <laughs> help nature and clean up the mess. Right. So, All right, well, uh, all right, let's, let's shift gears. Go ahead, Max. Oh, the humanity. Speaking of nature. Yeah, no kidding. I think we're behind. Did we get to your week in review last week? I no. think we skimmed the surface. We barely. Yeah, we, we touched on one part, but the part I really want to get into right now is A, know your zoning ordinances when you build something. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, every time I go out on some of these sites where somebody's doing so you and i did a patio together once upon a time yeah and that patio ran into issues because they were putting in outside fire 
there was a few issues as long as we're talking about it. Yeah, there was when water you, issues and angle issues and drainage issues. Well, but, it was also within it, it, it had to, it was there was a pool back there. We had yes. to stop a certain number of feet from the pool. Yes, they were. Yeah, they were going to put an outdoor kitchen. There was a uh, very little grade for the water to run off. So there was a few issues, few challenges in building that. Yep. All right. Well. Once again, I, I get to go out on a job site, and there is a magnificent pergola, and right up next to the house, inside of the pergola, is the outdoor kitchen. Mm, 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 mm. And it, those outdoor kitchens are, in my in, in in terms of, you know, history, they're very recent. I mean, they're within the last 20, 10 to 20 years that the, they became a real hot Come they were a hot right. item 150 years no, ago but when I'm, you didn't you know put the kitchen I mean. like, in the house. But, everybody's yeah. doing them now, and you got to think about that. That's and a, you're right. adding a lot of features into a covered space. So. All right, guys, if you're going to have a chimney, there's a reason the chimney sticks out above the house a certain distance. Why is that? Because we we should talk about chimney safety. That chimneys. There's oh a reason my. it goes way up there, right? Yes, yeah, so that you don't set your roof on fire. <laughs> how about how about that for safety? Yeah. Of all right, there are reasons you cap these things because I know the game Amy Angry Birds is popular, but that's on your phone, not your chimney. They'll uh, go in there, right? Oh I mean. my gosh! A friend of mine did not have a capped chimney when they purchased this house and the spring came along and it sounded like there were a thousand birds in that chimney. And every time one of the parent birds would fly in, all of the kids would scream. <laughs> and I mean, it was loud. It was like, what are you, what kind of video game are you playing in here? So, you know, all right, guys, bird nest debris and that kind of stuff will all catch on fire flame at your chimney, crack your mortar, and cause you thousands and thousands of dollars worth of damage. Right now, while it's pretty and clean, and we've got rain back again, and I always advocate doing, you know, like the the soot cleaning logs you can buy and put in your fireplace to oh, get yeah. the soot out. If you're going to do that, do that on a day when it's raining. And that way, any weird stuff that might flame up and come out of your chimney is going to be extinguished before it gets into anything. Oh, that's um, a good idea. So it doesn't. If you're going to put in a fire pit, if you're going to put in a fire pit, and I'm going to say it one more time, if you're going to put in a fire pit, please look above where you put the fire pit. Don't put it under the giant maple tree. <laughs> I literally just had to have that fight a couple of days ago with with. Not even my client, just just as a side observer, I looked at that and I went, oh, so when you how, you got your fire insurance paid for? Because <laughs> this is all going up. Oh, gosh. And, <laughs> and I'm sorry, just because you want it there and because you think it looks hot in the picture doesn't mean you're not going to burn your house down. Right. Please, 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 ladies and gentlemen, as we get into this season, and we're going to talk more about this as we get closer, keep fire safety in mind. If you're going to set something on fire, it wants to burn. Speaking of that real quick, because one of my uh, pet peeves is you, if you have a bunch of treated lumber around and it's like, well, I've got all this, these two by four scraps from Ooh. when I built the fence. Don't burn that stuff. That's got arsenic. What happens when you burn arsenic, Alan? I mean, nothing good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there there is stuff that burns well in your little fire pit. And really, your landscape timbers should not go in the fire pit. No. Now, a little chunk of cedar would probably be real nice. Oh, that, that smells smell good. good. Yeah. And it crackles and it pops and right. it, all that. But keep in mind, it crackles and it pops. So when you put these features in, please be aware there's an area effect. Yeah. So make sure that you've got these covered. Now, there's lots of cool new fire suppression devices out there and fire extinguishers. And you and I, you showed me a video of the firebomb. Those are cool. They're like little hand grenades that you throw. If your kitchen's on fire, you run outside, you throw it through the window and poof, okay, it well, like puts out the fire. All right, we don't have those quite yet, but if you go to your local big box store, there is something similar that is a handheld 
It's less than a fire extinguisher, but it's a single-use device. So if you were to have a car fire or a grass fire, your fire pit went crazy, uh, you would hit this baby, depress it one time, and it works like a fire extinguisher, and it will put that baby out. Right. So my experience from a couple of weeks ago is please, please, please plan these things out, measure these things, and look. Yeah. Please, please look. And if you're not sure where you can put that giant concrete stove that you just bought, please go online and look up some regulations because they got to be vented. They got to have a smokestack. It's got to be X number of feet above a roof structure. Please make sure you get these right. And you will be much happier, much happier with your outcome. And I would say, too, if you've got teenagers or, you know, 12 year olds or something, don't tell them that they can have their friends over and use the fire pit without supervision because they'll burn everything in there. They're very experimental at that age. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and some of the stuff they burn floats off at, while it's in flames, and I, they think I, it's hilarious. But... I, I think most of my friends that are 45 are pretty much yeah. guilty of that. So <laughs> I got... Well, I like those. I like those fire pits where there's a kind of a screen over it or something. Yes, you know. Yeah, well, plan accordingly. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like Captain Safety, but plan. Yeah. Be safe and enjoy it okay i don't know how much we even we still didn't touch on everything you did this week but uh (laughs) we'll probably uh, circle back and hit some of that uh in the second hour of tool talk radio but also i can't wait in our great moments in building history when we talk about franklin field in pennsylvania you're listening to tool talk radio we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. And welcome back to Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning, here with my buddy Alan Gilbreth from darkoakmedia.com and our pal Max over there behind the glass. You can call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901 683 zero nine eight nine and uh especially if you've been out there celebrating uh national turkey vulture day i'd love to know who spearheads the uh i mean are there are there fan groups for these guys alan i'm sure there's conservation conservation groups and things oh, yeah. like that and let's face it they serve an important function we don't want dead raccoons laying in the road if they're no, gonna, no, if they're gonna no. have a smorgasbord have at it man at least it gets it out of the way so but uh they do serve a purpose in nature so we're all we all we're all for them and of course we've we've been learning all about igor that uh Alan's buddy owns a pet turkey vulture, which doesn't surprise me. I mean, I it doesn't <laughs> own it. It just lives there. It's just like his roommate. Okay. So I'll do, I have to, I do also have to throw in as you drive down 64 as you're headed towards Fayette County. Yeah. I love the fact that in the mornings, the turkey vultures were all sitting on top of the traffic, on top of the uh, street lights. Oh, yeah. And they're, they look they're interesting. Up. I mean, they're just lined up and they're watching traffic intently. They want they want <laughs> they want chaos and they want destruction because that's when they get to eat. So but uh, anyway, so we've been learning about that uh, a, a little bit uh, before the break. We were talking about fire and safety and, and all that good stuff. I do have sort of a uh, question for you about that, though, Alan. So um, just to kind of book in this conversation. So we have a living in our living room. Now, our home was built 70 years ago. It was built in 1952. So over 70 years ago, we have a fireplace that we have not used in over 10 years. Right. Now, the last time we used it, we were using those little um, we were using what are those log, you know, like the the the. The, the ones you get at the store, right? You light it, a Duraflame Wax or whatever. And sawdust, right? Yeah, exactly. But the reason um, I don't know, we thought maybe it would smoke less or something than wood we'd get out of the yard. But anyway, basically, it would burn really good, and then and, it, and there was no issues with venting, and then as soon as we uh, it got to where it was petering out, it started smoke started coming into the into the. Um, into the living house. room right and i know you told me that had to do more with uh thermals and things than right. than a, any fault of the fireplace but i guess we were determined this year that we're going to probably buy a new fireplace grate with uh with glass so that it'll keep things behind it when, okay but what issues do you think we might run into obviously we thought we need to clean it but yes 
What issues do you think we could, if it's just been sitting for 10 years? All right, well, we we're going to get into safe. positive pressure and negative pressure. Talk to me. Okay, so of in the commercial world, let's say you have a, a trash room, a place where you want to put your soiled items <laughs> okay. of by code. Like a mud room, you mean? Uh, like a mud room, right. Okay. You, so you have a, you've basically a trash room. In the commercial world, by code, that needs to be under negative pressure. What does that mean? Like your bathroom vent fan. If you turn your bathroom vent fan on, the bathroom now has negative pressure which means any air in the bathroom is now being augmented by air from around the door. It's, you mean sucking, it's sucking air it, in. Yeah, because it has to have air coming in or the fan won't work. Exactly. Right? So air you don't live in an airtight bubble, so you're not creating a vacuum. But when you turn on the little bathroom vent fan, you are negatively pressurizing the area so that Let's just say the lovely scents and gases of the bathroom are not escaping into the rest of the house. Right. Okay, so your fireplace works on a similar principle. Depending upon the air pressure outside and the air pressure inside as to which way the air moves. So if you've got a big, heavy thunderstorm rolling in and you got thick, heavy, cool, moist air, it's going to come down the chimney and move into your home. Mm. Now, when you put a log in it and you fire it up, now you're creating a thermal updraft and it is taking room from inside the house, the air from inside the house, and it's moving it with the warm up and out the chimney. So as the bricks warm up, you create a thermal pushing air out of the house. Right. No, I get it. It's going to battle against the – and I guess the same is true in the winter. I mean, if you have cold so, air pushing down versus the hot air pushing up, it's whichever is stronger It's an at arm that wrestling moment. match. Right. Exactly. And that's what creates either a downdraft or an updraft. But I, I guess – Now, I'm if saying, you block it off and put you know a glass front on it that stops – the difference in the pressures, then that will help mitigate any smoke odors elim of emanating from what's left in the bottom of the fireplace. I guess what I was wondering is, um, okay, so it sounds in theory though, um, if we put the glass front, the main thing we just wanted, like I said, because uh, if we go to bed or whatever, and we want to make sure right. everything's covered, and if there's a few little embers or whatever, but the bigger thing was. Um, it sounds, if I'm correct, that we still have a healthy chimney, right? Because, I mean, it's function. It, well, I mean, 10 years right, on, nothing, we don't know. We don't, right, but has anything fallen into it? Is we don't what know. I so know. What, what would you do, like, if you were us? Because we were thinking we'd probably get a chimney sweep out there, right? And then Again, not a bad a camera, idea. Right? Not a bad idea to have somebody professionally clean your chimney. Okay. Never a bad idea. Of I would personally get myself a moving blanket and lay it down in the bottom and take a flashlight and look up the chimney and see what you personally see. Well, Do that, you see any damage? The, uh, the, the thing about that, though, we have, what are the, what's that called, a flue? Yes, you just open the flue and you can Will angle that open up there. far enough where you can oh, see yeah. up there? Okay, that's what we need to do. Yeah, so, so you, you can take a look and you can see if there's a lot of debris built up in it. But I will always throw in having your chimney professionally cleaned is always a great idea. Okay, cool. All right, that, that, that's what we're going to do, and I'll report back. But we thought with all of this redecorating we're doing in the living room, why not get the, the get that fireplace baby fired working? Back and, up really, and get it working, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, hey, Max, let's uh, let's shift gears here. Um, I've got our must-have item of the week that uh, it's it's as prime. This one is old, Alan. It's, uh, <laughs> you can see this is not a new implement, but uh, – Go ahead and tell people what I'm holding up here. You are holding up the infamous three-inch flat-edge putty knife. And I will say, this is not the high-dollar one either. But I mean, this is the one. Oh, I need a putty. I need a, a putty knife. I grabbed the, the four-dollar one. Now, yeah. back when I bought this, it was probably three bucks. It's that old. This has got to be 15 or 20 years old. But the reason I brought it in is it, it occurred to me. That uh, for one thing, uh, you can't see it because I'm, you know, you don't have the cameras on, but uh, the edges are rounded slightly 
from over, you know, they've been used a lot. Yeah. But what's funny, Alan, is how little I actually use this for its intended purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it occurred to me, I almost never put on spackle or sheep, you know, drywall mud or anything with this. It's, but it's, it's, so it's three inches across. It's very narrow, but the blade has just enough firmness that it gets under places. Yes. It tucks things in. Yes. It removes things. It works as a great scraper. It does. Yeah, um, I like it. It is the Swiss Army knife of tools because I use that exact same putty knife for a thousand different things. I had a PSA about, uh, regarding this right now, though, because one thing, folks, if you have a, uh, I wonder if there's some people that don't ever do this. You know how, like, when you buy a two by four, you want to make sure if it's straight, you get, you're get you're at the big box store. Right. And you put your eye along the edge. Our eyes are very perceptive. You will see if that thing's bowed mm -hmm. or if it's warped. Well, most putty knives, if they get above three inches, they're going to, one one way or another, they're going to put a bow in them. You're going to see, right. like, this one has a curve. And by all means, if you're scraping something, my, my PSA is put the rounded edge down. Yes. Because you don't want to gouge out. Otherwise, you're going to have these two, scr the scratches, two scratches on the edge. instead of the flat pole. Yeah. And use that to your advantage as well, because it, it's amazing how well it works when you have the curved edge down, but it works terrible when you have it uh it, when you have the pointed edges down, uh, you know, facing down, it doesn't scrape properly. It's just kind of, you know, but it's interesting. I wonder, I bet you, I bet you, you have tools that you use in an unconventional ways too. Every right? tool gets you. <laughs> <laughs> it's now, fair game. I mean, why not? That, you know, a screwdriver can be a chisel. Of, you know? yeah, right. I, I have to confess, I have one of these that is torn up. Oh, and sure. what I did was I cut a little notch out of the center of it, and I make it the nail or screw holder. Oh, so so the edge of this thing is totally trashed. You know, it's never it's never going to be a decent scraper or putty knife again. But like I said, I cut a little notch out, and that way, when you're trying to hold that screw at a weird angle, it just balance it up there, stick it up, and now I can and pull this out easily before the screw head goes into the wood. You know what else it is? It's, so it's I, I love, I absolutely adore these things. That's actually a pretty good idea, Alan, because the other thing it would serve is if you're if you're tapping in a finish nail at an awkward angle yes. or something, it keep it's like a human shield. It's like it shields oh, yeah. it if you if the hammer misses, you hit the, the this little mm -hmm. thin piece of metal exactly. instead of whacking and and uh damaging your, your so trim work and even in so. death my tools don't escape me. <laughs> <laughs> they're never really useless mm -mm, until mm -mm. i guess until they're a fire hazard or they're gonna you know uh, until you actually up. hear me go uh ooh. <laughs> yeah we get, we get a lot of mileage out of our tools i have to say so um but anyway that's our must-have item of the of uh, the week a three inch spackle knife well max is rubbing his hands together i never thought i'd see him this excited about discussing football but uh when we come back in honor of the uh, start of uh, uh college football season we're going to talk about the world's oldest uh football stadium in america or well whatever still in use today franklin field Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. Now, this is the forklift. You need, you need a license to operate this machine. That means the upstairs office workers can't drive it. Quiz, Mike, should you drive the forklift? I can and I have. No. Nope. News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Don't worry, the turkey vultures will be sizing them up soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael Scott must be uh, <laughs> surrounded by turkey vultures in his life. Anyway, welcome back to uh, Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thoris Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning, here with my buddy Alan Gilbreth from darkoakmedia.com and our pal Max over there behind the glass. You can call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989. Of course, you'll have to leave messages, but uh, we promise we will address those when we come back next week because um, uh, we're, we're pre-recording the show because of football and uh uh which is very apropos for our discussion coming up here max and now great moments in building history i never thought you'd be interested in this man i mean let's let's pull back the curtain i know you produce some of the football 
uh, games around here uh, with the great team over there at 98.9 and everything. But uh, Max, you were really you really sunk your teeth into this conversation. It's not what you think. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, in honor of that, we thought, OK, um, it's the kick, you know, it's the kickoff of uh, college football season. And we thought, why don't we look back at the oldest and uh, still functioning football uh, college football stadium it's called Franklin Field and it's uh, Penn State's I learned a lot on this one Alan that's one of the nice things about our uh, great moments in building history I mean I, w- I personally speaking I learned just as much as anybody else with this so but um, for one thing it's a really beautiful stadium it's it's Greek classic architecture which <laughs> it was funny because they wanted they wanted something more along the lines of what you see uh in in Chicago at the 1893 World's Fair, that kind of like what you see. What I don't even know. What was that? That was Roman architecture. What was it? The White City. Mm-hmm. They yes. Were, they wanted something like that. Then uh, the 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 uh, superintendent of the school got the bill and said, "All right, can we do something nope, a little nope, more nope, affordable? Nope, nope. Scale it back. Scale it back. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really a beautiful stadium. It's kind of if you check it out, folks. It's almost like if you could picture a really classic looking, almost like something you'd see at Oxford on one end of a horseshoe that's sort of at the top of the horseshoe and then it's basically horseshoe shaped and it's really neat so the the uh the opposing team comes out of one tunnel on one side of the field the uh the home team comes out on the other um the other area the the areas in the building are for you know i guess working out the locker rooms sport other sports activities and everything but back in the day alan we're talking 1895 when um Franklin Field was built. Of course, it was named after Benjamin Franklin. And football wasn't a thing yet, Alan. I don't even know if football was invented back then. But they thought, uh, they saw the benefit of having, of of making athletics a, an important part of the uh, curriculum and an important part of the university experience. Because let's face it, people need to, uh, you know, young people need exercise. They need to, mm, mm, it, it's mm, important mm. for your, your development to, uh, and sports are fun to watch. And so, but I found it very interesting that they built this before football became a thing, because I think there's some something we can unpack there but anyway well all right your classic track and field mm-hmm. which is the the basis of all sports <clears throat> however you want to put them together however you want to mix and match them pretty much every sport out there has some aspect of traditional greco sports mm-hmm. you know where it's ancient greece where we're back in the days of the original olympics and they were all basically track field and warfare yeah yeah how to throw a javelin how to shoot an arrow how to throw a discus how to run how to this how to jump but you know they were kind of like weapons that you made a sport out of and that was more or less the point of the becoming an olympian right Uh, so the modern olympics you know we we have what we have today and it is an expansive list of sports but every single one of them traces back to this point so here we are. We've had a couple of really good World's Fairs. That's we're true. Back they made in, an impact. Man, two, we're, this is two years after the Chicago World's exactly. Fair. Exactly. We are really in the the world of innovation. Because keep in mind, guess who else is working at this time? Eiffel. Oh, yeah. We're getting the tower. We're getting, you know, just think of all of the amazing projects be taking place all after 1880. Yep. Because, you know, the Statue of Liberty is on the way. The Eiffel Tower is going to show up. These amazing world's fairs are showing people a world that they can only begin to imagine. And it's, you know, you just made me think of something because we always think of the Industrial Revolution. We always think of how, you know, game changing our technology is today. But, Alan, the other part of this is we had. Uh, photo- photography was a thing now. Mm-hmm. You could see a picture of the World's Fair with exactly. the lights on. So if you live back in the day, you were thinking, you thought you were living in the, the heyday of you innovation. Were. You man. were it living in the heyday yeah. of innovation. So here comes Penn State, and they're looking at this, and they're they're looking at everything happening in the world around them. And we talked about this last week with Urban Renewal, that sometimes somebody has to have a vision and place a bet. Yeah, there you go. So here Penn State goes. They go, all right, we are going to build. And of course, since it's a sports thing, it's going to be built according to 
kind of Olympian ideals. Right. And it's the ideals of the time. So we're 1880, 1890. We're looking at the turn. I mean, you can't imagine this. We went through, you and I lived through the turn of the century from 1999 mm. to the year 2000. Yeah, the turn of the millennium. Here we go. These ladies and gentlemen are living at the peak of technology, the peak of human civilization, and it is about to be 1900. Mm. There was a lot of excitement to this. Yeah. The world was full. I, I, yeah. You know, steam is a thing. Electricity is becoming a thing. So Penn State looks at this and they go, well, what can we do? We need to do something. And, well, they decided they're going to break ground in 1895. And they've got Frank Miles Day and Charles Clowder. And these guys sat around and drew this up and thought about it and brought to life what they thought was the ideal stadium for collegiate activity, for Olympian activity. Well, the, the And they did a pretty good job. It's still in use. It looks cool. I think what's interesting to me is just the cuz I always think of how thing one thing influences another and when I look at the um the architecture of Franklin Field I'm like, like I said, if folks, if you just picture a big horseshoe and uh, but on the other end is this beautiful building and they didn't have to make that. They could have just made an oval shape. They could have kept it simple. Right. And it didn't have to be attractive. You know, they could have made it just functional. But I think there was something that they wanted this to be uh, a, a nice space to look at and something inspirational because that built I, I think the. It, it just inspires, I don't know, it inspires something when you're there. Well, let's face it, there's been so many historical events, too. Presidents gave their speeches there. You're in Philadelphia, the birth, you know, yes. the birthplace of our of, of our nation, you could say. So, I mean. Well, you, you just kind of, you, you can't think of this in isolation. You really have to look at this stadium as one of the pinnacles of its time. Yeah. Because who in their right mind in 18? 1990 ever thought about putting 40,000 people in a stadium well they, uh, well yeah. you know, it's nobody really considered that before nobody really thought of well what are we going to do with locker rooms and how are we going to build sports and how are we going to uh, efficiently use all of this space and they did well, they were ahead of their time, too, because they understood that people were becoming interested. We're start. I mean, you know, we're in the middle. Uh, you know, baseball goes back further than this. The Cubs have up. They've been around since 1874, I think. So, I mean, you've you've got people watching and paying to see sports. So they knew they were on to something. They knew that sports were could be a, a centerpiece. But I wanted to ask you something, because this is um, this is something. OK, like I said, the Franklin Field is built in 1895 before col you know, before we had college football and all these things. But the track, a 400, what are they, 400 yards or 400 meters, whatever 400 that meters, is. Yeah. Okay, well, it's an oval. It's an ancient design because, like you said, well, it just so happens that a football field fits perfectly inside of a track. We've seen it. So my question is. Was the size of a football field determined because it would fit inside of a track or is it just a coincidence that it happens to? Because I feel like maybe the design came from that, you know, well, function. you have to fast forward to 1920, 22, when football is now a thing and they're setting up rules and the football field was actually 130 yards long. Oh, I didn't know that. It was 130 yards because they decided to add to the football field the two 10-yard end zones. Oh, so we didn't have end zones. Not in originally. You just ran but across we, the line. We, and, we, okay. we wanted to put up the goal post and add a kicking thing, and so they're doing right. the rules. However, some stadiums had already been built, and they weren't big enough to be 130 yards. Mm. So a football field was then ratified as 120 yards with the playing field being 100 yards. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So, so form and function kind of act.
accidentally fell in place. Yeah, yeah. Of, but again, we were looking at the Greek ideals of an Olympian-sized stadium. So a lot of these uh, measurements were more or less legacy, and the architects did the best they could to make them fit. Yep. Well, uh, and it worked. Well, Franklin Field is a home for many firsts. There's a there's a lot of firsts. We're probably going to get to some of those. I, we can't name them all. But also, uh, there was a lot of expansion that took place. We've got a lot of fun things to. There's a there's a lot of fun discussion around Franklin Field, and we're going to continue that when we come back here on Tool Talk Radio. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. <laughs> News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Let's just say this is going to be appropriate later. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, very good, very uh, on point, Max. And welcome back to uh, Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning, here with my buddy Alan Gilbreth from darkoakmedia.com and our pal Max over there behind the glass. You can call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989. And please be aware, of course, we're going to address your messages next week. So um, if, you know, if you've got something about how you're celebrating National Turkey Vulture Day or if you uh, want to chime in on this uh, great discussion we're having here about um, the uh, country's oldest football stadium uh, or other good topics, uh, leave a message and we will definitely address those next week. Um, uh, speaking of uh, football and uh, people that enjoy sports, uh, I wonder if Jay Hills, uh, I'm, I'm sure later today he's going to carve out some time to uh, watch the um, – <laughs> Yeah, watch some football and um, hopefully I'm sure the University of Memphis will have won by this time. But um, uh, regardless, Jay is more or less usually laser focused on his uh, uh, roofing and remodeling work. And especially he's all about the exterior protection of your home um, from roofing to siding to gutters to windows. It is an entire system that works together. And when it's working harmoniously, as it should it, it, it protects your home. It's going to, I mean, let's face it, Alan, we've, how often have we said water is the enemy? Well, Jay is. is the man that keeps the water out of the places it shouldn't be. And it's a top down operation. And um, the other thing that um, sets Jay apart, well, for one thing, he is one of the top rated uh roofers in the in the uh in the mid-south he's a uh, uh, always five stars with the better business bureau he's a gaf master elite installer which you have to be qualified for there's training there's engineering involved with that they don't just let anybody put up gaf roofs but um also the other uh, uh important feature is jay hill is a former insurance agent and that is hugely important especially as we get into the season where things are going to start falling on your roofs we're going to start getting storm damage uh, when the outside of your home is damaged by weather or other problems, um, that's a process if you have to make a claim with your homeowner's insurance. And Jay should be the very first person you call because uh, he is he's going to become uh, your advocate. He can come out. It's a free consultation. Have Jay look over the, uh, the problems on your roof or on the outside of your home. And if there's a path forward where you can make a claim, uh, for your homeowner's insurance, it's going to save you thousands of dollars, and uh, it's a it's really exciting when that that happens. That hap uh, Alan and I both had our roofs replaced that exact way, and it saved us. It probably saved me over ten thousand dollars. It was it was very exciting, and uh, and Jay also brings a real energy and uh, optimism to every project that he's uh, that he's a part of. So um, we love Jay Hill. We love the uh, the business culture they've created over there. And they also offer great financing if you need to finance. He's got 30 lenders at his disposal. And Jay always encourages you to call him directly. So uh, you can reach him at 901-484-5645 or go to bigmroofingandremodeling.com. All right, hey, we're, we're having a really fun discussion here all about um, – Penn, the uh, Franklin Field over at Penn State University, built in 1895, which is the oldest functioning um, football stadium in the country. It's probably the oldest function, even if it wasn't functioning. I think it still is one of the oldest. Um, it's a it's a home for many firsts. I will just say it's the home of the first radio broadcast in the 1920s, mm -hmm. um, broadcasting of 
a football game. It's definitely the first one to have two decks. They they built it with one level first, but they had enough foresight to leave room to build a second deck. Um, there's a lot of things. The president um, Eisenhower gave a famous. That's where he gave the uh, rendezvous with destiny speech. It's not just sports that that have happened there. But I wanted to just say, uh, give you a quote here that I found really interesting. There was an Australia, an Austrian art historian, Alois Regal. I don't know if I pronounce his name, and he he said something I thought was very interesting. He said uh, basically. He was talking about unintended monuments, and he said those monuments that are not deliberately made as such, but considered so in posterity through the value they have accrued over time. In other words, I took that to more or less mean, if you build it, they will come. If you build a noteworthy space, noteworthy things are gonna happen, and when you look back on it 50 or 100 or 200 years later, it suddenly becomes a very important historical. So that involves planning though. You know, you gotta plan it out mm -hmm. and make something special and interesting. So it's cool. There's a lot There's a lot at um, <laughs> that's happened at Franklin Field, including some pretty funny things that I know Max has been dying to, to get in on. <laughs> so go ahead and don't let us run out of time before we talk about the track because there's actually home improvement lessons to learn about that but go ahead max there's been some funny incidents that have happened let's go back to december 15th 1968 <laughs> okay right before christmas and let's just say i'm a eagles fans and philadelphia fans have had a long reputation of being exceptionally hostile what i love about this joe is earlier in the show you mentioned the snowball effect well this is the result of a pretty big snowball <laughs> let's just say that this was a terrible year for the Eagles. They wanted their coach to go, and it was snowing, and you couldn't clear out all the snow, so to say. So let's just say they had plenty of ammunition. So if you're sitting out in the stands, and these are bleachers too, so that even more space for snow to collect. Oh, yeah. So, and not yeah. only that, but the entertainment director at the time of the of the stadium, Bill Moon Mullen, was down a Santa. So he had <laughs> Wait, to what do you mean quick. he was down a Santa? Um, uh, other Santa was snowed in somewhere in New Jersey and couldn't make it. Oh, so they were going to cheer up the fans by bringing Santa Claus out on the field, or exactly? But they were down <laughs> a Santa, and so for, and so Bill had to think quick, and thus entered twenty-year-old Frank Olivo, who let's just say filled the build quite good because he would he came from a family that loved to celebrate Christmas by him dressing up as Santa, and guess what? He showed up at the stadium dressed as Santa. Oh, he so, was already in costume. So guess who Bill Moon Mullen flagged down in order to kind of last minute get the Santa? Good news for Bill is that Frank was quite the showman. However, <laughs> let's just say the audience was as receptive. Like I said, they were angry. They were cold. They had plenty of ammunition to throw. And <laughs> they were ready to go. And so... Let just imagine, let me just set the scene here real quickly. You yeah. got um uh, you got the announcer um uh, kind of saying, "Let's give Santa a warm Philadelphia welcome." <laughs> <laughs> then you hear then the cheerleaders come in dressed as elves and in the middle of them is This is after they've lost like almost every game. Like they've only they won two games this whole season. Two so. out of eleven, and not only that. <laughs> That's funny. And then here comes okay. Santa Claus starts playing, and then Bill, and then Frank comes in. Here comes Santa Claus. Boom! Oh Throwing the gosh. snowballs, and when they ran out of snowballs, they threw their hoagies and sandwiches. <laughs> That's full commitment, Al, if you're throwing your Philly uh, steak sandwich at them. Exactly. It was, it was cold by then. Yeah, you were mad by you that. Were, okay. And yeah, they were they were bad, but not bad enough because let's just say there were some other factors that considered to that. But anyways, the the fans weren't angry and everything, and actually Frank just kind of took it with a plum. Um, uh, there was a guy who was kind of pot shotting them from a close distance and jokingly said, "You're not getting anything for Christmas this year." <laughs> <laughs> but, and the funny thing is, is like so like, he was given as good as he was getting. So. Exactly, but not okay. only that, but Frank, he like um, uh, when they got back to the stands after his let's just say performance, the crowds actually cheered for him. I rather bet, than booed. Man. Good for him. And the only consolation prize that he got was a pair of cufflinks and a tie tack. And so that was all he got for the fact that he was pelted by a total of a hundred snowballs and who knows what else what.
Hey, I'll tell you this Philadelphia fan thing. I don't care. I, you know, if you're listening in Philadelphia, you probably know this is true. It's not unfounded. Those fans, Philly fans, mm-hmm. Eagles fans, mm-hmm. they're brutal. You you mess up and they're going to they're going to make you pay for it. But I'm picturing the scene. This guy thinks he's I mean, he comes to the game dressed as Santa. He's in the spirit. He's out there supporting his team. I don't know why they had to take it out on him. I mean, but uh, it's funny. You're in the they stands just blew and suddenly off some steam. That's, that's like, what they were doing. That's like a dream for uh, a fan being invited out onto the state, into the into the field to entertain everybody. So that that's became so they became um, known as the the fans that booed Santa. And they even had a song written about the situation. Oh, they need a movie about this. This is good. So <laughs> it was a local I, I bet musician. ESPN has done some sort of special on it. I think it. Howard oh. Cosell did a thing about it, too, which would be perfect. Well, uh, speaking of Howard Cosell, thanks for tossing it to me. That That's, that's a good handoff. Um, now, Alan, you were listening to this game, <laughs> you said. So this is 1970. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've, we've all heard Howard Cosell. He's almost like became a parody of himself, right? I mean classic delivery the guy was it, it, you know very well known how it many was people imitated the voice. Howard well, it's, it's the like, voice the the whole look his attitude everything it was like harry carey you know it was an expected voice if muhammad ali was fighting it was howard cosell on ringside you know you're like okay here we go <laughs> and he but the thing about Howard Cosell I now maybe cuz I was a naive kid okay Harry Carey there was no pretense he was in he was talking about all the Budweiser's he was slugging oh, yeah. back in oh, the yeah. game. You knew he was drinking. I didn't know Howard Cosell drank when oh, I was yeah. a kid. Oh yeah. I and I was like, sometimes he said dumb things too. <laughs> <laughs> he he got he a little off odd track thing. on occasion. Yeah. Well, yeah. on November twenty third in nineteen seventy, the Eagles were playing the Giants, and uh, he had I guess he threw back a few too many, and he got so drunk that he threw up on uh, the color commentator's Don Meredith's cowboy boots Yep. right before halftime. This is Howard. Ugh. Yeah, he. they had to leave the stadium. But here's the thing. He took a taxi all the way back to New York. What would that cost? A taxi from Philadelphia to New York? Well, back then was 50 bucks, but you know. <laughs> okay, and Alan was listening to the game. I'd like to get his hot take on that. You were a kid back then. I would have liked to have been the taxi driver. And we've got a few closing thoughts about the uh, infamous Franklin Field when we come back here on Tool Talk Radio. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. Was that the was that toilet always next to the refrigerator? Ah, uh, Nat. You ever try lugging a toilet up a flight of stairs? News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Especially if it's an old toilet, there's always water. Even if you think you drained it all, there's always water. As soon as you tip it the wrong angle, you're going to find out about it. You know that, Alan. Don't look at me that yes, way. Yes, I do. <laughs> and we'll come back to uh, Tool Talk Radio coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning. Here with my buddy, Alan Gilbreth from darkoakmedia.com. Our pal Max over there behind the glass. And spontaneously dropping into the studio, our good buddy, Brandon Olmsted from Geek Tank Radio. Oh, yeah. I guess you couldn't, uh, you hear about us, you hear about Ho- Howard Cosell throwing up during a, <laughs> football game and having to leave and drive back to new york uh you're gonna jump in on well that. every so often you know i'm just i'm tooling around town and you get into a subject where i go i want to go really unleash my anger okay because you're no fan of howard Cosell. I'm no, no i'm i'm a i guess a broadcast purist okay i want if i'm gonna be behind a mic i'm gonna be professional and i don't care how famous you get if you can't be professional behind the mic you don't deserve to be there yeah and i know he's there's a lot of people out there that love him but i am not one of those people okay well if you're one of those people that hate howard cosell as well let's not be smirch the dead i mean i'm not gonna say that well i don't know him okay but i was not i am not fond of his uh his delivery. His professionalism, so okay. to speak. Well, you can chime in at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline, 901-683-0989, and we will address your concerns and your comments next week on the show. I hope we get some because this is a pretty this is a pretty fun topic. I know we're talking about the University of uh, Pennsylvania's um, Franklin Field, but it's, it's, it's the 
it's the spot of a lot of historic events. A lot of really interesting history took place there. But uh, circling back to this Howard Cosell incident, because the Eagles played there for, oh gosh, what was it, 15 or 20 years. And um, it's a really worthy venue. It's a nice place. But uh, Howard couldn't hold his liquor. We were talking yeah. about in December, uh, November 23rd, 1970, he threw up on Don Meredith's cowboy boots. And basically, he just left in the middle of the game. And he left Keith Jackson and Don Meredith to finish the game. But here's what I'm wondering, you guys. They didn't, they barely mentioned it. They didn't yeah. say Howard's uh, sick and he let, they just more or less acted like nothing happened and kept going. Now that's, I salute their professionalism. Well, do, do, <laughs> the rule is show goes, man. You right. just, you dig the in. The show must go on. The people, all right. And here's the other thing people found out. So long as somebody's calling the game, they don't care, man. Keep calling the game. Let's go. Okay. The game's not going to stop because somebody got, you know, the tummy flu. Let's go. Just keep rolling. Uh, however, in Mr. Cosell's career, there were several, several evenings <laughs> <laughs> where, let's just say, the 33 and a third record was planted about 32. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can tell. You know, it's funny because, like, I was and saying, nobody this, Brandon, under the age of thirty got that reference. <laughs> no, I. Get, but, but Brandon, growing yeah. up, I I remember listening to Howard Cosell as a kid, and I was naive. I didn't realize he was drinking. I didn't. No. I mean, I, we knew Harry Carey drank because he talked about it. He oh, yeah. freely told you, "Bring me some more beers up here." Yeah. But yeah. Howard Cosell would go on these long, <laughs> rambling sentences, and now that I'm thinking back, I bet he just was trying to figure out what he wanted to say. Like he, you know, I don't know. How much? Uh, how much of that was alcohol influenced? I guess so. <laughs> you know. It was a different. All right, it was you a gotta different look time. at it and say, guys, the '60s and '70s. Go watch a few episodes of Mad Men or Mad Men, and mm -hmm. you'll understand. It was a different era unto itself. Yeah. Well, there's there's no denying that uh, Franklin Field has a has an aura of its own. It's cool. I'd like to go visit it. It looks really. It's a beautiful Field venue. Trip. It's very pure, I would say, in terms of the design. There's function, but they wanted it to look nice. And uh, the building, it's its a worthy venue to go visit if you want to see a bit of history. And I'm sure it's its great for game day. I'm sure there's a lot of, oh, yeah. a lot of great games. I do want to say one thing uh, in terms of film. You know, I'll give this to M. Night Shyamalan. He's a... Uh, He's he's kind of reminds me of Craig Brewer a little in the sense of his loyalty to his hometown. He always seems to include something from Philadelphia or Pennsylvania in his movies. Uh, F uh, Franklin Field was featured in Unbreakable, which I have to admit isn't one of my favorite of his movies. But no, but we get to see David Dunn in in like you know his full uh, poncho in the rain. Yeah, yeah. But another great movie that wasn't M. Night Shyamalan, but the movie Invincible, it's a true story uh, that Mark Wahlberg played. Uh, I forget the guy's name, but he was he he was a walk-on player. He was like 30 years old, and he yeah. wound up playing for like six seasons with the Eagles. There's a lot of great history. It's definitely worth uh, – uh, uh, it's uh, definitely worth a visit and a, a trip down the rabbit hole for uh, Franklin Field on YouTube. I do want to say one last thing, though, about it, uh, and I wanted a roundtable, because this t this goes to do with proper planning and maybe anticipating leaving a little breathing room in your design choices, Alan. So this is interesting. They have a track, as we said, uh, going around the football field, because that's what it was built for. Well, so let's see, there were five lanes. I want to say there was five lanes when they built it and lane, the farthest outside lane was very close to a brick wall. Yes. Well, as track and field became more popular, they wanted to add, uh, they wanted to add lanes to it because they wanted to, uh, you know, expand and make right, more teams. Right. Well, mm -hmm. they had to add three lanes and there was no way to add it to the outside without tearing that whole wall down all the way around. So they put three lanes inside the oval, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. So lanes one, two, and three are actually shorter than than uh, 100, whatever it is, 100 or 400 yards. So another, they have to do some really weird math. And to get around that, they put a rail, it's like four inches across. It's almost the size of like a, like a, a railroad uh, rail. It's about four inches tall, four inches across, and that separates lanes 
three and four. So if you're running on that track, you're actually separated from your opponents. Alan, I see all sorts of problems with that. If you're running <laughs> full out, I don't care that this thing's only four inches tall or whatever. To me, that's a tripping hazard. You could. Oh, yeah. How many people have wiped out on that uh, that rail? <laughs> I, 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 it depends on what event they're holding as to how they align their track of, but you know, it, it works. They've had it. It's been there all this time. They're still using it. They're still training on it. Um, I can't imagine that there haven't been a couple of spectacular blowouts, Yeah, but they seem to be doing good. I figure just as many people trip over that who have, you know, not taken the, the corner just right and slammed into that wall. Yeah, <laughs> but I get. I have to imagine that the runners at Penn State have a decided advantage because they're used to this whole lane yeah. setup yep. and everything. So, and I think the way it works is they have to actually move a few things mid race, like as they round the the other end of the track. They're moving. I think they might even be moving the rail, but it's a weird it's a weird idea. So I guess the way it relates to home improvement, in my opinion, is leave some space. Even if you don't know what you're going to put in that space, you may decide to do something in 10 years or 20 years. So mm -hmm. don't just, I don't know, give yourself some breathing room, I suppose. Absolutely. That's very astute, Joe. I did not expect that from you and Tool Talk. Really? Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, there's a lot more stories, but we can't make the whole thing about uh, Franklin Field. So, um, hey, uh, Brandon, how yeah. are you celebrating Turkey Vulture Day? Surely oh. you were out there doing something. I'm <laughs> you know he's trying not to make a donation <laughs> i uh i don't think that's something i can actually say on the air okay anyway you know, it's it's for the best that some things stay uh secret no that's okay hey i wanted to switch gear. boy we're jumping all over the point uh all over the place but um uh i do want to say something about you know people are always complaining about life today and and we've never had it worse and everything and i i always disagree with that wholeheartedly for one thing in the world of lighting alan the world of lighting is so much better now when you go to the big box store um man i was looking at the uh, choices you have well we had a light we bought a brand new lamp for our living room and it, it i we took we put a 60 watt bulb in and it just looked awful it, it lit it improperly and then I went to the store and I bought a 40 watt amber light bulb. Have you guys used those? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, those things are the bomb. They, they, That's my PSA for today. Get yourself a 40 watt amber light bulb. They totally give an entirely different vibe to any room you put them in. They do. It glows. It gives. It almost gives off the warmth of like a fire or something. Yeah. And it's a simple device. It's a simple little, a simple little fix. So, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I don't know if you're a fan, Alan, but... Well, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, working uh, at a private house from the 70s, and the 70s called one of their light fixtures back. Hmm. So we took down all of the uh, old, you know, old style fixtures, put up brand new LED infused light fixtures where the LEDs were adjustable. Oh, nice. So a kitchen, which had been... Uh, lit about as well as an ice cave on Hoth. <laughs> <laughs> this thing looked it really just it looked terrible, and it was just the lighting. Yeah, and there was no, you couldn't paint or decorate this to make it look good. However, changed out some lights, and they were fabulous. Don't overlook lighting. Yeah. Hey Max, it occurred to me. Boy, we once again the show evaporated before our ears next week i guess we got to get back to the history of the stapler we never even got to your deep cut it's an evergreen discussion but for, but santa claus had to be discussed absolutely but it's time to get out of here you guys so on behalf of my buddy alan gilbreth and the visiting brandon olmstead and our buddy max over there behind the glass i'm joe thorderson thanks for listening to tool talk radio and we'll see you next week <laughs>